Good afternoon. Welcome back to the PH Virtual Event Space. You're tuned into the Passionate Photographer Critiques, hosted by Lassie. So a huge thank you to them for hosting. And a huge thank you to the passionate photographer himself, Steve Simon. Welcome back, Steve. How you been? I've been great. How about you, Derek? Uh, hot off the uh, build show? Hot off the build show. A very successful, packed build show. And I know you were there. I didn't get the link with you. We were both so busy that we didn't even get to connect. So now we had to wait. We had to wait I for the virtual know. thing. I don't know how we missed each other. There were only about 250,000 people there, but uh, it was great. I, I saw a few people uh, from the critique sessions. I, I was actually doing reviews and there was such an energy there that uh, I'm kind of excited. I think it bodes well for, for the industry, for photography. It's, it felt great. And I, I hope we uh, have more of those shows in the future. Definitely. I will echo those sentiments. It hasn't felt like that in a couple of years, especially in, in the expo world it felt like it was kind of on a uh, decline there so that hopefully that pumped up the industry again and uh steve we're all re rearing to go we got some submissions in we got you ready to go and uh, i'll turn it over to you and let's critique some images well thanks very much derek and uh you know being september 11th and the fact that we're all photographers here i thought i would start out uh, just because uh it was a long time ago i can't believe you know 2001 the time is flipping away um, I don't know, Derek, your scenario. I, I know you're, you're a young man, but uh, at that time, uh, what was going on with you? Were you a photographer even? I was not. I was taking snapshots. I was actually in school about 15 miles outside of the city at Montclair State University, where we watched the smoke billowing into the skies from, we were up on a, on a mountain over there. So mm. watched yeah. it from afar. I was uh, with my cousin. We were actually in Miami, and we were scheduled to fly back on September 11th. Of course, that didn't happen. And I apologize. These are kind of low-resolution files, but uh, this was the view coming into the city on September 18th. And I just remember when the the, the plane sort of tilted, uh, made its turn to get to LaGuardia, uh, my stomach sort of sank, knowing kind of what had happened and uh, not sure what I was coming back to. And, you know, as a photographer, I wasn't really sure kind of what to do. I mean, having this documentary photojournalistic uh, practice that I had, um, I kind of wandered around. I really avoided uh, the site itself. But when I did sort of happen upon it, I noticed the reactions of people that were coming to the site. I think at the time, just to sort of see that it was true, because it just seemed so unbelievable when we saw those images and you have to remember Derek at that time um, you know the phone cameras I don't think we had them yet obviously it was still very well documented but it would it's nothing like um, what we have now in terms of the proliferation of cameras so I decided um, you know that I would just kind of when I saw the intense reactions I decided to to kind of you know do a, a set of pictures around the periphery, of course, nobody was getting in, um, just to sort of show kind of what had happened uh, by, by reflecting sort of the people that felt compelled uh, to come to the site. And for three months, and that was in the film days with my Nikon F100, I shot about 100 rolls of Tri-X film. And eventually uh, the images from this um, turned into a book uh, that came out the year later called Empty Sky. And uh, I'm also happy to say that the 9-11 uh, Museum purchased a set of these images. And, uh, you know, that's a, a good place to be. So these images will sort of live on in posterity. But, yeah, it's it's so long ago, a generation ago. So, you know, there's a, a whole new set of perhaps listeners that uh, were not here at that time that are into photography now. And uh, it was film. You know, it was just mm. kind of pre-digital so things were were very different. But in the end, you know, as we often say when it comes to the pictures that we critique here, uh, it really doesn't matter what you used to uh, take these pictures. Uh, you know, in the end, it's a two-dimensional representation of the reality that you're trying to communicate. And, you know, the more you have to say, the, the, the more powerful um, your message can be in your, your photographs. So um, I guess we'll start off, and I figured we'd start with this cup of coffee just to get the caffeine uh, in the system and, uh, and going. Uh, it was really the only uh, kind of still life that was uh, presented here. And uh, I love coffee. 
Uh, you love coffee, so <laughs> it's hard not to uh, enjoy an image like this. Um, uh, you know, I would have to say though that you know, in, in looking at these these coffee beans in a cup with the steam and the beans down below, um, I think the the light is good. And and one thing I will sort of shout out to you guys is that um, you know, be mindful of the size, the the file size that we're requesting, because unfortunately, oftentimes the file size that you send is, is really small. And I know the zoom screen and, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that get in the way of, of what the image looks like ultimately in the show here, but having higher resolution files, uh, you know, makes things a lot uh, better for, for, for everyone. Um, I love the concept of this or the cup and the steaming uh, beans. I will say though, that it feels a little bit kind of manufactured, um, you know, I'm not sure uh, what the photographer did uh, to create the the steam, um, but it looks a little bit uh, constrained, like it's coming from something maybe behind the cup. Uh, even the beans below feel a little bit um, arranged. And I guess in these kinds of images and, you know, in food photography, generally speaking, it's such a um, high art that ultimately, when you see the image, you just want to kind of smell the coffee, so to speak, or, or taste the food or smell the food without necessarily sort of seeing anything. And I'm being kind of hypercritical when I when I say that. Uh, but that said, I love the concept and I think the execution is is quite good. Definitely. I, I, echo, I echo everything you said. Uh, my two minor critiques would be um, this would benefit from a V flat or a white card uh, camera left behind to kind of bounce some light and give some shape into the left side of the cup. It kind of bleeds into the background there. So just a little, a little pop for you guys that are doing product photography, pay attention to the light that's coming and being reflected back onto. Yes. Right. Right. in there. And just to give that a little bit of an edge, it's similar to putting a hair light on a model that, kind of pops the hair off the backdrop it's a minor detail but it helps i would like a little more breathing room at the top if you're gonna put that steam again like you said it looks like the steam's kind of coming from behind um i'd want to see it a little more realistic to look like it's actually coming from the beans and it kind of sells that that uh advertising pitch there um and a little bit more of the steam i think uh you know a, a different composition that allowed for room at the top would be would might help this image out a little bit. Yeah, I think really the best part of this image is is the concept and the execution. Mm -hmm. You know, as you detail, uh, could be improved a little bit. But it's it's a great attempt at something. And I guess we're we're looking at at it from sort of the high end. You know, if this were to be used as an advertisement for a major coffee company, for example. Um, it would have to be kind of perfect in that way. There, there wouldn't be any sort of criticism there. And, and it, it takes a while, you know, if you haven't done this kind of thing, uh, there's a, a kind of learning curve, you know, in ter terms of the lighting, uh, as well as, uh, you know, oftentimes on food shoots, there's food stylists who, who their whole sort of career is to just kind of arrange things for the photographer who's going to capture it. Now we we don't necessarily you know have the ability to hire food stylists if we're interested in this, but we can learn more about it. And you know I think it's a, it's a, a really good good attempt. Um, the next few images are are kind of portraits, and um, uh, I wanted to sort of uh, show you kind of what we have uh, to come. Um, now I guess the difference maybe between sort of uh, uh, an image of the person sort of looking at the camera and one that's candid, then we'll see a few uh, coming up in just a little, um, is that obviously the person is aware. And uh, in some ways, it's a little more difficult to capture kind of the strong portrait of someone who's posing for you if they're not a supermodel like Derek and not used to, to posing for a living. Um, it often feels a little bit awkward. Um, that said, uh, this one kind of... Uh, falls in between sort of the posed portrait and sort of the candid. It's a real moment. And uh, I started with it because it's just such a, a powerful uh, image um, on many levels. And I, I think that it also goes to show that um, when it comes to photography, 
uh, the technical sometimes gives way to the content and the moment. And here's an example where you've got um, these two people. Uh, and it's a, it's a moment where she just grabbed him and she's kissing him. Maybe it's his birthday. Who knows? Um, but the expressions are fabulous. You know exactly kind of what's going on. Um, her hand in his cheek. She's really kind of pulling him to her. And it's just really kind of a, a, a kind of a magical moment captured by the photographer who was ready for kind of a regular picture and ended up with something, I think, a little stronger, albeit, um, again, it's a, a bit of a low resolution file. There's a little bit of movement, but that movement, I think, actually helps this picture. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think an image like this, I was thinking about it and I'm like, if it were clinically sharp, and there and it was frozen where the move the motion is frozen and there was none of that slight blur i don't think i like it as much i think it adds to the realness and motion equals emotion absolutely and you know it's it's akin to not to compare it but you know when you see images of a helicopter with a fast shutter speed where the blades are kind of frozen versus the right slower shutter speed to show the movement of the helicopter while keeping the helicopter the body of the helicopter sharp Oftentimes, that's a better way to capture that. And I think that's what I was thinking when you just de described this. But it's it's a really kind of uh, beautiful moment. And here's where a thousand words are delivered in the picture. And that's something we are always trying to do. And not often, time, not often do we necessarily achieve that. Uh, sometimes it's 883. Sometimes it's 426. And sometimes it's more than a thousand words. And uh, depending on... The person who uh, receives this image, uh, for a lot of people, they're really going to enjoy this 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 moment captured, which is why you kind of want to be ready for the unexpected when you're shooting, and uh, and then we sort of moved to this one, which obviously is a very uh, sharp image of this young man, and I think um, Derek, oftentimes uh, when it comes to portraits. Um, you know, the portrait never goes out of style. I mean, when I was in London, they have a natural national portrait gallery. It's dedicated to portraits because, you know, as human beings, we're, we're fascinated by faces and there's so much that can be communicated in a face. Um, in this particular image of this young child, um, you know, the eyes are, are so powerful, but, you know, it's everything because, you know, the, the expression um, is a very serious one. And, you know, that's something I often say to people, if you're going to pursue sort of street portraits, which are kind of exciting to pursue, because you never know when you're going to get something really great, aka sort of Afghan girl eyes, Steve McCurry, that's kind of maybe the, uh, the, the holy grail. Um, but it's the eyes that can be so powerful. And we don't always know exactly what's being communicated. But there is something strong there. Um, and, you know, the fact is that this kid is posing, the other kids are kind of trying to get into the camera, photo bombing. Um, but there's a very powerful expression. And, and lastly, and I'll let you speak, Derek, but the intimacy of shooting with a wider lens, which I have a feeling this one is, um, is something that's palpable and you can see it, you know it when you see it. Um, if you're a portrait photographer um, in a commercial uh, endeavor where you're trying to make people look good, you probably wouldn't use, um, you know, a 50, you would use an 85. That compression can be very flattering. You might shoot from a little bit from above. But as a, a passionate photographer, you want to make a compelling image and you're not necessarily out to satisfy anyone else other than you as the artist. It's kind of a little bit of a selfish pursuit, but that's okay because that's going to mean strong images. And I think that physical proximity, I can feel it in this picture as well. Totally. I, I agree with everything you said. My one small critique, I would like to see it with a little bit of the left edge cropped out just to bring the kid in the center's face a little more centered. Sometimes when you have, so mm -hmm. the fact that the face on the far left, there's not enough light on it. It's kind of a dark spot in the same way that the brightest area can pull your eye. That dark spot there can pull your eye in. And what happens is if you look at the background, there's a little bit of an edge to the kid on the right. You have a large edge to the kid on the left. As you bring that kid, the kid in the center more to the center, it 
makes that that composition really takes it and pushes it over the top. It's a strong image either way, but it's just an example of how even the slightest compositional, I won't quite say error, but oversight um, can really leave so much out there. This makes it such a stronger composition when you bring it in a little tighter. Yeah, if it seems sometimes that we're being very kind of nitpicky in some of the suggestions, it's only because you know, we're responsible for everything within the frame. And if there's a way to make that picture even slightly stronger before we release it out into the world, uh, yeah, we're going to take advantage of that. Um, in this particular instance, I mean, I'm a big fan of maintaining the aspect ratio because I often look at images as not just singles, but as living with other images. And when you have a series of images, be it on your website, your portfolio, et cetera, or gallery show, um, I like the consistent shape, which um, I think sort of keeps you in the narrative when you have a sudden, if you're jostling around between squares and, 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 and rectangles, uh, vertical sort of uh, asterisk, because, you know, it's still the same aspect ratio. Um, for me personally, I like the discipline of living within the frame, but, you know, you can do what you want. And oftentimes that aspect ratio does not necessarily mean it's it's the perfect balanced composition, but I'll just deal with a slightly imperfect composition and maintain the aspect ratio. But yeah, just as you said, Derek, I think um, you know that's something you're going to hear us say a lot. And you know we're shooting so much in the digital realm, but we're not sort of spending that kind of time with every image. It's only those four star, five star ones that you know these are the ones that we hope to get, and when we get them it's worth making sure that we enhance and crop and, and bring out the very best. Um, yeah. of the and Steve, you, you bring up a great point about the aspect ratio, and this is why it's so important to have these critiques and not just watch or listen when your image is being critiqued, because you can learn from the critique on this image. So the next time you're taking an image like this, you don't have to worry about the aspect ratio being a problem. We've all had it. I have it where I, I missed something at the time of taking the photo and then because I want to keep the aspect ratio uh, standard, I miss something. And I'm like, eh, it's, if I bring it in and keep the aspect ratio, I lose a little too much. So on this, you might lose a little too much of the top or the bottom, and it might throw off the entire composition. So these the, the purpose of these critiques is so that you can make the changes as you're seeing the shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so this image here, I think, um, you know, has a little bit of a problem in this, in the sense that um, the focus does not seem to be there. You know, partially, look, you can see it's a very small file size. So it's, it's, it may be there, it's just being sort of upsampled, which makes it a little bit hard to critique in that way. But let's just assume that's, that it's in focus. Um, again, you know, this, this guy is the one that's sort of the, the main subject here. We have uh, this gentleman here who I, I get a sense is somehow affiliated with this guy. Um, I don't really feel that the connection the photographer is making is, is too familiar a one. So I almost get the sense that, that these kids are, are not necessarily um, you know, part of the photographer's community. Um, there's a little bit of hesitation there. I don't think it's like weird in, in any way. But you know, the connection you make with your subject will be communicated. The stronger the connection, oftentimes the stronger the photo. Uh, so this is more kind of a representation of what this guy looks like. And I like the bouquet, the out of focus, the fact that you're using a um, uh, uh, pretty wide aperture. And that just keeps you where you want to be. And that is with the, the, the main kit. It's maybe a little too central. And, and maybe the expression is, is not overly compelling. I think there's a better picture to be had in this situation. And oftentimes, if they're looking at you anyway, taking the picture, I would try and, you know, extend that photo shoot, maybe ask them to do something or maybe just move slightly here. Maybe I'll move them close. So I think this is um, a good start to a potential kind of portrait situation of a stranger. Um, but I don't think it's quite as strong as it could be. Yeah, nail on the head. There's there's a better picture in this interaction somewhere. There's just for me, there's too much to be changed. And in in critiquing an image, it's is it eighty percent there and just needs a twenty percent push, or is it 
20% there and needs an 80% push. And that's where you get into the territory, like you said, Steve, where there was something here. There was already a rapport built, even just in connecting, work it, stop, you know, engage with them. Or they're, they're apparently comfortable with the image being taken. Put yourself in a better position to create a more dynamic image. When you're going to incorporate lines and shapes into an image, if they're not playing into the image, they're so recognizable from a young age that anytime you're going to incorporate that in, they're going to draw your eye. And if they're not drawing your eye into the image and taking you around the image, then they're a lot of times a distraction. So I, I go immediately to that X on the left there. And mm -hmm. I want my eye, if you look at the kid's expression, the kid in the foreground, that is one of the most powerful expressions you can have. It's like the Mona Lisa effect. When you have someone making eye contact with you and they kind of just have this blank stare of you don't know what they're thinking, it engages us. It makes us want to know what they're thinking, but it draws us in and that eye contact does. So again, we don't know how sharp the image is. The resolution's a little low, but take that eye contact and work it and form your, your composition around that. Okay, again, a kind of a, a low resolution image, but I think it's it's sharp. Um, it's just a, a small file. And I, I think that, um, you know, again, the whole Robert Kappa, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. It's nice to come in really tight at times because suddenly um, you're kind of, I wouldn't say in confrontation, but you're sort of, you know, right up there looking at the face of wh whoever it is that you're, you're photographing or the viewer of the images. And um, by filling the frame the way um, the photographer William did, um, you can't not kind of confront the, the kid. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice expression. Um, it, it, you know, he's not really smiling, but he's not, you know, he's, he's more on the smiling side than, than on the, the frown side. And, uh, you know, I often say that a smile is a beautiful thing. You want to capture it. And some of the best pictures are of, you know, beaming people. But the more evocative image um, often is where there is no smile. And you have to kind of try and figure out, you know, why is this face so kind of compelling? What's going on that he's giving me that look? And I think as a child here, this is kind of kind of in between. And um I think the photographer did well to kind of move in close. We'll assume that the eyes are sharp. Um, but again, you know, as Derek mentioned, I think that you want to kind of work it a little bit more because this is a very pleasant image of the kid. Um, but if you want this image to be more for an audience outside the family of this child, then it has to be a little bit stronger. And oftentimes either a crazy smile or a very serious face will, you know, head in that direction to make it more successful. Keep going. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, did you that, want to say yeah, on that last okay. one? I realized I was muted. I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> um, for me, it's going to be a point of contention always, but I'll throw it out there. Uh, watermarking images when you're having them critiqued. You're going to have some photographers who are not going to care. You're going to have some photographers who are wildly offended by it. You're going to have some photographers who will just point it out. Me, do I care either way? No, but keep that in mind as you're submitting images for a critique because it plays into the overall experience the same way that you know, we're, we're looking at your image. We're going on, what do we have? It's an experience. It's a feeling when we first look at the image and seeing a watermark, especially something like this, where it's right up close on the face. There are photographers that will view it as a distraction and they are treating your image as the image with the watermark. And they're not looking at the watermark as something that's added after the fact. So just keep that in mind. Um, I actually feel I there's something about this image that makes me want to see it pulled back and wants to see the environment because of what's going on is that mm -hmm. a hat was it raining and just like a, a magazine or something draped over the head whenever you're going to add an element that is unclear what it is keep in mind that somebody might focus more on what they don't know than what they do know we know it's a picture of a child is it well executed yes but my eye goes to, what is that on the child's head? Why is it on their head? 
So what does that make me want? It makes me want more of a story. It makes me want more of an environmental shot to show what's going on in the image. Yeah. And, you know, with respect to the watermark, you know, coming from the journalism, photojournalism world, um, I'm used to my images running in a magazine or a newspaper, uh, sometimes with, you know, type within the image. And, you know, there's, there's good ways to do it and not so good ways to do it. Um, sometimes it's almost a little bit of disrespect to the image to have, uh, you know, a headline in there sort of blocking or distracting from the image itself. Oftentimes it can be very clever. We see in advertising using the right typeface and font and so on to, to make it work. Um, but, you know, for us, it's the image that tells the, the thousand words. We don't really want to see the words necessarily. Um, you know, so, so that's something to consider, at least, uh, you know, when you're submitting images here for, for the critique. Um, all right. Well, now we have uh, a very resolute image. This is a bigger file size. Uh, a beautiful woman posing for the photographer. It looks like, you know, she's in a restaurant setting. Uh, the light on her is very nice. Um, you know, the, 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 the engagement, the connection that the photographer makes is translated to us. We're the benefactor of that engagement. So, you know, that's why, um, you know, when you think that, oh, I'm a little shy or I don't want to work it so much, uh, think about the thousands of people potentially that are going to see this image. So it's not just you involved. I mean, you're taking a picture for others to also appreciate. So, you know, the 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 more you work, the more you strive to make the image strong, um, the better it's going to be for everyone involved, including the subject and including the viewer. Um, I really sort of like this image. Um, my only kind of uh, criticism is more of a micro composition one. And again, I'm sort of the figure skating coach pointing to some little thing, but everything counts within the frame. And that is kind of the placement of her head kind of in this position. It's not really, uh, for me, all that distracting, but the fact that this line comes right up into her head here, I would rather see her face maybe you know, within the window and, and to see this line on its own. And it would just take either a slight movement of her or a slight movement by the photographer to kind of move, move around. But, you know, this image, what is what it is in terms of kind of a environmental portrait? Um, it feels maybe a little more commercial. Uh, we can use for the restaurant website or whatever, um, but it's good. And then, you know, the other the other weird thing that's often difficult to deal with is sort of the the arms and the hands and where to crop. It's a little bit um, uh, a little bit odd to see the crop of her arms here. Uh, that's something that needs to kind of be worked. It's, it's not at all a deal breaker, uh, sometimes by coming up a little bit. And, you know, I guess we want to keep the, the chair there. Um, but, you know, there, there are sort of good spots in terms of, you know, where to crop the body and cropping kind of at the joints, et cetera, can be a little bit awkward. Um, so go ahead, Derek. We're critiquing too much together. You're, you're reading <laughs> my mind on everything. No, I um, know. And I, I have the benefit of going first because uh, it's the passion of photography. This is your show. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's okay. You can reinforce and and you're you're always adding um, new stuff to it or you're you know little things that make that it can be very meaningful. So it, yeah, it's and, all and good. an image like this, and it's funny because I'm not a big photoshopper, but in certain circumstances, for me, it was it was when you were pointing to the lines in the window, the really egregious part of it for me is the the light, the highlight at the top, where it's mm. sticking out from the head. And that's really where. I'll even venture to say, yes, is it distracting with the line going up through the face? But without that part, maybe you can get away with it. Maybe if you pull her a little further away or like Steve said, put her a little closer. But again, it goes back to what you were saying in the last image. There's beautiful light all around. You have directional window light. It looks like a nice, elegant place. She obviously, she looks like a hostess to me or a manager. Um, this is a situation where work it. Find out what's good. They're, you're going to be there. They're going to be there. Work to get your shot. Sometimes you just have to slow down a little bit and say, you know what? I have time. Let's let's make this a really good shot. And that's something that you can turn around. And like you said, I look at this and I can see it on the restaurant site or LinkedIn for, for her or something like that, where you can work this into an opportunity. I'm always trying to be the opportunist and taking 
a chance to take a single photo and say, hey, they might love it and say, why don't you come back and do some some images for our restaurant? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me, you know, I've had uh, at the Build Show, for example, there were a couple of professional photographers that I was sort of honored that they'd come uh, to, to speak to me. And um, there were a couple of situations where they were doing sort of personal work um, and the personal work would lead to kind of a big advertising job because the personal work was out there and um, the advertising agency saw it and thought, you know what, we have a campaign and we want you to do that <laughs> with this. Um, so I have a feeling that maybe this is more of a commercial endeavor, this particular image. And um, though I think that we stand by what we're saying. Uh, chances are, uh, if this, if she's the client or the restaurant's the client, they're not necessarily going to say anything about you know some of the 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 little things that we're talking about. But you know, for us, always striving to do better. Um, you know, we're going to learn from that. And as Derek mentioned, I mean, if this isn't your photo, um, we can all kind of remind ourselves that you know the micro composition. When there's time, when things are in your control you can easily kind of move over and work it a little bit and, and fix those little things if you kind of are aware of them. And I think for a lot of us, you know, it's just a little bit of experience in the sense that, you know, we're maybe a little nervous in the situation and everything, you know, it's 93% there. It's just that little 7% that could make it a little better. Uh, I think maybe you'd think about it, uh, you know, the next time. Yeah. And an easy checklist before you get started with this one, Steve, is look at everything that is going in the frame, out of the frame, and protruding from behind your subjects. That's a great way whenever you're taking a photo, taking a portrait, um, and, and for what's going in and out of the frame for any photo, you don't want something at leaving the frame or at the, near the edge of the frame. That's where you can, you can cre use it as a creative technique. But if you pay attention to that, so if you in this, if you were to look back and say, okay, what's come, you know, it's a portrait, what's going behind her, what's going behind the head, what's, what's protruding from the head and for limbs, where are my limbs leaving the frame? That's something that you, if you notice it while you're doing it, this checklist for while you're taking the images, you're going to say, you know what, maybe I should have her bring her hand up. So it's in the frame to kind of anchor it. And so it's not being lost because you also have behind her, it's dark. She's wearing a dark shirt and it's dark behind her. You want to anchor that. So always keep those things in mind. And it, it'll, that's one thing that helps me when I'm taking images. I immediately look and I look for distracting distractions and what's coming in or out of the frame. Yeah. And, and I, I'm the same way. And, you know, I guess I've been doing this so long, but here's something to consider as well. So as you're sort of lining up the subject, um, before I even begin to engage, I'm going to sort of put her head kind of where I want it in the window. And, you know, now uh, I think we're blessed with eye detect. So no longer do we have to necessarily, you know, fixate on keeping that single point on the eyes. The cameras do it for us. And this way, once you have the sort of composition arranged, now you turn to the engagement to try and get a beautiful expression like this. Um, as opposed to just sort of lift that camera up, start to engage, and maybe you're not completely ready, as uh, Derek described. So, yeah, absolutely. So this image, I, I think, um, just from a technical perspective, um, it wouldn't be hard. And you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of in limbo here. I don't have my full setup, so uh, I can't always uh, see everything on the screen. I'll just hit the sort of auto button just to lighten his face a little bit. Um, but I think that, you know, in this particular instance, um, uh, it's an example, I think, of, you know, letting the subject maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable in, in, in the frame. Um, this gentleman uh, feels like a little bit of a reluctant uh, um, subject. Uh, but what's interesting is, you know, him, he himself, you know, his hat, the environment of where he's at. Um, I can see I'm just is that fridge? I think it is. Um, it looks as though I get a sense that it's kind of a, uh, an outdoorsy kind of a place. Maybe it's a fishing village. I can see water just faintly in the background. Um, and, and his face and, you know, his, his kind of, you know, not clean shaven. Uh, I think there's a lot that's being communicated there in this picture. 
I think the color can definitely be sort of, you know, fixed up a little bit as well if you want to keep it in color and maybe even consider uh, black and white for something like this. Um, I think, you know, there is something there to his expression. Um, I think still there might be something even better to be had from this situation. But I just wanted to point out the fact that sometimes that uncom uncomfortableness of your subject uh, can can deliver something um, that's useful and positive to to the image, um, and and I'll you know I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. I'm always distracted, you know the the Tolson the the name of his his car. I mean it's it's frustrating. I, I, I you know words uh, on people's clothes design unless it's kind of relevant. Um, backpack straps, you know they drive me crazy oftentimes, but that's just the world we live in. Uh, they don't necessarily help the composition, but let me, I'm interested to hear what uh, Derek has to say. Yeah, the little details. So it looks like Spanish to me. Um, mm. Like what I can make out, um, treat the animals with care, which okay. gives a little bit of, a little bit of information. Information is always good in here. I like that that was left in. The smallest detail that you might not think about at the time can be so helpful Later on, I can't tell you how many times, Steve, especially when I go back and, and I'm putting together a project or a book or a compilation, the more image or the more information I have about my images, because you think you're going to remember everything, you think you're going to remember locations, but sometimes the littlest thing, you might forget where this was and you see that sign, you read it and you said, oh, this was an animal sanctuary or this was, you know, something, a zoo. And the smallest piece of information that can help you down the road because for me, images are about remembering. It's about creating a memory of what we've done and, and all of the steps of our lives and all, the, all that we've experienced. So having as much information to look back on is great. I, I'm going to echo again everything you said about the expression. It goes back to like the expression we talked about earlier in the portrait of the kid where you don't know, is he does he not want his picture taken? Is he just uncomfortable in front of the camera? I think that creates something where it's interesting. Absolutely. Um, and the last of the images where someone's actually engaging with uh, the photographer looking back at you um, is this one. And um, again, you know, it, it's, it's a solid image, but again, we want more than that. You know, we want, you know, we're, we're looking for the five star. And I think there's a difference between an image that could easily, you know, grace the magazine uh, on a story of travel, et cetera, versus an image that, you know, is really truly um, kind of there in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it, it goes more than, than, than kind of a literal representation of the place and the people that you, you see. Um, uh, you know, it's a great subject, this woman, uh, her face, she's a little bit older, and, you know, uh, the the wrinkles on her face uh, tell a story. Um, uh, but there's also um, an element, and I don't know if the metadata is here. Uh, yeah, so you can see here, well, I can see that this was shot at F13. So the photographer shot this image uh, with, I think, a lot more depth of field than should have been chosen. Because not only do you see the woman and her wrinkles and her hand and the water, but you also see the background. And the background is really kind of taking you away from where you really want to be. And that is kind of landing, you know, to look at her really beautiful, interesting face. Um, the color, too, is, is a little bit distracting, um, which is why, you know, I have found that that Lightroom and I don't know how you feel about it, Derek, it's just gotten so much better to the point where sometimes even the light is not as important as it used to be because you can manipulate the image in a way that, and enhance it, I guess, in a way that, you know, it looks kind of the way you envisioned it, even if the actual you know, light wasn't there. So I think you can enhance this, you know, there, there are you know, the, the, the choosing the subject, you can see how it chooses the subject. And if I hit the invert button, I can immediately sort of darken everything down. But we're looking at the bones of the image and the bones of the image, there's no reason to shoot it at F13. I think that was just an oversight. Maybe the last shot was at F13. 
Um, you know, you have to sort of know that if you focus on the face, the face will be in focus. And I think the opposite is true in a shot of this kind of uh, subject. You want her face to be the sharpest thing in the image. And then everything else, if it's a little blurred, will just keep you where you want to go anyway. Um, and I, I'm sure I can see you nodding in the background. You feel similarly um, Definitely. when it comes to this. Yeah, color, color and depth of field. And this is where I was just explaining to somebody at Build um, about the relationship between photographer and subject and subject and background. And that, again, looking at the the details of the image here, you know, maybe that wasn't something that could easily be changed. Um, and maybe it was a photographer who wasn't carrying more than than one lens. This is a situation where you're kind of at the mercy, it looks like. You're not on land, looks to be on water. Um, and it could be a moment that is fleeting and you just have to shoot it. Um, again, you, I think you mentioned it earlier, Steve. There's some images that we just kind of have to accept. We didn't nail it. There's next time we we captured it. We might not have been able to create our best image. For me, it's the distraction in it. Um, I would have wanted to see more compression if possible to separate the subject from the background. And like you said, the color can be a distraction. The blue poles in the background can be distracting. I saw you playing with the the black and white there. What yeah, did you watch, think? What are you, watch, what's your personal what opinion? Happens. I mean, for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big sort of, uh, I'm actually writing a book called The Magnetic Image. And all images are magnetic in the sense that your eyes are being sort of pulled into certain parts of this, the frame. That red is really strong. The blue is too, but the red is really strong. Mm -hmm. But watch what happens when I just click to black and white. Suddenly, that's no longer an issue and you right tend to, to go more to the to the subject so okay. you know the f13 is less of an issue in the black and white version than it is in the color but it's still you know everything we said i think still still applies you know in terms Definitely. of the depth of field of this but it's it's still a, a nice moment and a really interesting subject Agreed. Um, so the next uh, few images are all kind of more um images of uh candid images uh, with people in them and um, let me uh, sort of start with uh, these two uh, what they have similar is uh, looks like we caught someone sleeping a little bit um, so in this first image um, you can see it's someone obviously tired <laughs> resting their head I know how she feels um, you know it's it's she's got a jug of um, some sort of liquid it's a little hard to tell in the black and white image looks like a coffee lid here and she's just kind of tired um i think from a photographic perspective you know this image is a lot more interesting in that you know there's a lot of stuff to kind of digest here i i love images of magazine stands do we still have magazines derek do they still publish printed things I'm um, convinced it's just covers with blank pages inside. <laughs> you know, I, I often, you know, print is dead, all that stuff. But, you know, if you really, you know, look around and go into whatever sort of magazine stores are left, uh, there's still a lot of hard copy stuff being produced. Um, and, you know, what's really interesting about these kinds of shots are uh, it, it really is a time capsule. And I remember seeing, you know, the, main, the amazing, and I wish I remember the photographer when you know when John F. Kennedy was shot. I think it was taken on the train from Long Island, and you see all these newspapers with the same headline. Everybody reading. Well, not everybody reads the newspaper anymore, but you can really sort of scour and get a sense of things. And then, kind of in all this, you have your your person here, and she's kind of sleeping and resting on there. There's almost a platform drawn in right here, which really kind of adds emphasis. This is sort of the clear area and everything else is is kind of, and it, you know, it's very central, but I think in this instance, uh, it works. I, I love these kinds of images. Yeah, likewise. Um, this is one I'd, I'd want to see in black and white. You know, we talk about color. Can it add to the image? Does it take away from the image? The color doesn't really sell it for me there. Um, I think I like it in black and white. Yeah, like a like it a works nice black contrasty and black and white. It yeah. focuses. It brings your eye right to the center. Color. The color wasn't necessarily distracting, but I don't think it added to the image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think black and white works really well there. And, and when you have a color image, you know, one of the things that I'm often doing, I'm just gonna. It's just out of a zoom frame here, but I'm gonna take the vibrance control 
and I'm going to desaturate. Mm -hmm. And you can see, I don't know if it comes across there, but I've desaturated a little bit and, and that kind of helps. And we have selective colors. So if we find the red of the TV magazines too much, we can just, you know, do that. So when you have that final image, you can really, um, you know, maneuver it in a way that uh, brings out uh, the very best. Uh, one, so this is one, kind of, small, go ahead. one small thing on that, Steve, yeah. um, whenever you have shapes again, and whenever you're going to line something up symmetrically, you have the frame of the magazine stand on the right. You don't have it on the left. You have, you can see the top where it's more the, the center, the, the line going across the center looks even, but because you have that crooked line at the top, again, it's just little things like that. Squaring up an image are things that will draw your viewer's eye in a non-pleasing way. So this isn't, this is something where they've made it again. Steve has talked about the beauties of post-processing software. It's so easy to square up an image like this. You could take guidelines and just do it right around the squares of the frame and it'll square everything up for you. They even have an automatic that on this one would probably do the trick as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I use that all the time. I use Although, it probably every other yeah, image. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because, and I'm not sure kind of what the actual rules are, but um, you know, when you're uh, in journalism, for example, and you wanted to enter the world press, for example, they, they, they don't want manipulated image. There've been some controversial things that have happened, but is the transform um, function, is that considered uh, kosher for, for journalistic images? I'm, I'm not quite I sure wonder. that it is. I'm not quite sure. That's good, is. Maybe that's we'll, good question. We'll, we'll find that out uh, yeah. for, for the next time. Well, yeah. When you find that out, let me know. I will. I will. Okay, um, this image here, you know, it, it's it's kind of akin uh, to to this image in the mm. sense that I think there's there's movement going on in both of these images, but that movement is helping the picture, not hurting the picture. Um, I love it, and and I love this sort of moment. I could just say, you know, see her drinking, and uh, you know, it's it's a really kind of uh, dynamic composition. She's very much on the the right side of the frame, uh, a little bit of movement, everything that's there. And I think you know, this picture definitely, uh, the hair kind of swirling, you know, the 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 jewelry glittering, um, you know, there's just something about this image that uh, that I really like. Um, yeah, it has like a, it just like a timeless glamour to it. Absolutely. And and it, it really works. It's it's simplicity simplicity. I mean, there's just sort of a dark background. Okay. Not really sure of the whole situation, but you know, I kind of want to see more, you know, of what's happening there yeah. uh, in the series. And, but as a, a one-off, it still works very well. Okay. And even the framing, you know, we talk about and, and I know there might be some people out there who are like, wait, they're talking about stuff leaving the frame and the hands cut off and this and that. Sometimes this is where the rules are in place to guide us, but we shouldn't always adhere to them because this is a perfect case for that where, yes, is her hand cut off, but it fits with the entire motif of the image. And, and I think that's something that sometimes you just look at an image and you know if something's off. It doesn't matter based on a, a quote unquote rule. You just know, or you know if something works. And and there's certain circumstances, Steve, right, where you, yeah. you cut an image off at the elbow, but it works. It's not distracting. Or you cut a hand off like you did, you know, like the, the photographer did here. Yeah. It doesn't distract yeah. because the image itself, it just fits. Yeah, it, it's, it's honestly a case-by-case -case scenario because, you know, I think we can uh, provide some general generalities that that are true. But in the end, um, there are no rules. You know, rule of thirds is true in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of what we're sort of recommending is true, but it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, break the rule and it works. Ultimately, when the image works, it works. And, mm -hmm. you know, it takes a while for you to kind of have the confidence to kind of understand, you know, what's working and what isn't. And, and part of that confidence building is uh, learning from critiques of yours and other people's work and kind of arriving at your own decisions. And then as you do this, and as you keep shooting, you end up kind of unconsciously making these little decisions that make your work stronger from the get-go. So yeah, um, art is not a democracy, but it is true that the best pictures kind of rise to the top. 
and you can have all these amazing judges that would come out with different results. And I know Derek and I have both judged uh, many contests. And in the end, uh, you know, we may differ between, you know, oh, I think this one should be the grand and this one should be first or second. But, you know, usually it's rare that, uh, you know, you're, you're unhappy with kind of what the decision kind of is at the end. And sometimes you fight for things and sometimes um, you win and lose, but, you know. Okay, now this is more of a, a, a moment, a candid moment uh, at a market. Um, in I've never been to, I almost want to say Vietnam, but I don't know. Um, I've never been there. But uh, uh, I think that what I love is the hats. And I love the sort of uh, uh, engagement that these two uh, women are having. And we can see, you know, what it is they're dealing with. Um, but it's also distracting in the sense that uh, you've got people in the background and uh, just off to the side that you can't see, it, it shows that it's shot at F8. Um, and again, you know, that might be a little too much depth of field. Uh, it was shot at uh, 42 millimeter. And of course, you know, the closer you are to your subject, the less depth of field you have, regardless of the aperture, but there, there still might be a little too much. Um, Maybe there wouldn't be, depending on the moment and who was walking by and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the color. Again, I come back to the idea, is the color amplifying the content or is it kind of hurting the content and the treatment? Because the treatment, you know, your eye definitely goes up here and that's kind of getting in the way of, of this image. Um, so I think this image has um, a lot of good things going for, going for it, but it also you know, has a lot of distractions that, that are not interesting that are taking you away from this encounter. Yeah, definitely. It has the look, when I first looked at it, it has the, the look of like a cell phone shot where everything is in focus. And if everything is going to be in focus, whether you're shooting with a cell phone or if you're shooting with a mirrorless or DSLR camera and you have a deeper depth of field, you need to pay more attention to what's going on in the background of your image. I, I think this would be a great candidate for lowering the camera and sort of looking up under the hats. And then what happens is, you know, you move a little bit to the right, you kneel down a little bit or bend down. And now you have the women in the background filling the space between the two women. And if you are shooting with the zoom lens, you maybe step back a little bit, it, you know, and, and zoom in. And then you have a, the slight compression where you have just a little bit of out of focus to the background that takes some of the the heat off of what's going on in the background and puts it on the subjects there. Yeah, photography is a compromise. If you want more depth of field, you have to slow your shutter speed down. And though maybe this is the angle you want, this is not necessarily the angle that works. So you compromise by sort of changing your position, maybe not having as many of the other patrons there, but focusing more on the hats to make the image a little bit stronger, a little less distracting. So again, it's the working of the image. And when you said the cell phone, that was a good transition uh, to our next two photos. <laughs> okay, maybe the, yeah, I think they're both both cell phone images. And, you know, this is something that we see a lot, you know, and, and I remember early on, I even remember Lee Friedlander did a bunch of images and, you know, I hope he's doing okay. I think he's in his nineties, he's still around. Uh, he did something for the New York Times Magazine on, you know, cell phones and people on their cell phones. And yeah, it's, it's not hard to to make those images these days because that's what everybody's doing. Um, but in the end, you know, to make the image compelling as a one off, um, you have to kind of, you know, have something maybe a little bit more. I think if we have a series of people on their phones, these two images, and they're probably by different photographers, work together really well and they're starting to build some momentum into something that could be very interesting on their own um, there may be a little bit of limit to you know the the strength of it um, the picture on the left I do love you know her beautiful hair and the curves and all that kind of stuff that's going on her body language is nice um, the image on the right obviously is is you know one simple choice I'm not sure what that means obviously that's an ad this guy in the ad looks a little bit like this guy. Um, but for me, it's not necessarily all that compelling 
you know, on its own as, as kind of a single image, but it's a worker bee image, both of them. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I, I'll agree with you there. I, I do like how the hair flows into the overall shape of the image on the left. There's more gesture there. Um, we always look for words and images that say something about the image or add a sense of irony. And if, you know, one simple choice, yeah, it's kind of one of those things where it's like almost there with something. If you had something there where, it, you know, it, it leans into that, that saying or that phrase, it helps a little bit more or else you just get caught in a no man's land, so to speak of what's, what's the point of the image at a certain point, we, we have to look at images and say, what, what is the, what was I taking an image of here? What, what was the point? Why, why does this moment matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big, um, I'm lately, you know, more into sets of pictures and, you know, doing books. Um, I do a lot of, uh, well, book classes, but of course, books for me are, are kind of the ultimate uh, encapsulation of photos and a project, etc. So I can see this picture of the woman on the left, you know, looking into another picture that's yet to be taken of someone looking to the right, and then together, they become kind of one strong image on their own. They're not quite as strong, but together they're, they're much stronger. That's a, that's um, a great overall point, Steve, because I think you, your groupings of images should be a wonderful example to everyone how a slightly less strong image can be made so much stronger in the company of not necessarily great images, but I've, I've yeah. we've had times on here where you've taken maybe four or five average images but together as the body of work they all make each other strong they're strong as a body of work and i think that's very important yes. for people to to pay attention not only to individual images and the critiques but the groupings as well that's what's exciting about photography which you know it's almost sort of uh, the three-dimensional chess in the sense that you know the single image that you're out to get the best possible pictures but then you have all these great images now you spill them out you know, how do you, you know, sequence them, put them together? What happens when you do? Sometimes magical things happen. And, and that's, that's, that's another exciting way to sort of take your photography to, to the next level. So we've got these three images. Um, and maybe these, they're not. These will be our last three, Steve, just giving okay. you the two minute warning. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, you know, it looks like these top two uh, have to do with uh, water, I'm guessing. Um, and then the third one, uh, the tra trapeze artist, that's quite the dramatic uh, image. Um, again, you know, the sort of close up, uh, either it's steam, maybe it's a water park, something like that. Um, I like the image. I think that again, you know, it's a matter of kind of angle and maybe slightly to the left to see a little more of the profile of the face. But I don't really know exactly what's going on. And as, as uh, you know, the toe is a little bit awkward, as, as uh, Derek mentioned with the, the tight shot of the kid with the magazine on his head, you know, seeing a little more context, because in this particular image, you've got this sort of steamy kind of scenario. And I think maybe, just maybe, there's, there's something even stronger as you pull out, you know, on this particular um, frame. Um, here, a nice little tight, close up maybe it's a water park as well it's it's a little bit sepia blued somehow um but it works uh the face is maybe you know a little bit dark uh you want to see a little more uh, detail in the face but you know that's part of maybe what the photographer was trying to do um and this one's a little bit different so maybe we will we'll end on on these two but um uh did you want to comment on these same same thing that you said that that the two toes kind of come out of nowhere. The fact that not many people shoot in square format makes me think, I'm going to say think because I don't know, that this was not shot in square format and cropped that way, which leaves something, like you said, to the imagination of, I want to see a little more. I want to know. I pray that's not a subway grate he's sticking his head down <laughs> into, but yeah, exactly. we don't know what it is. So we're we're left to wonder. And I think that's where that environment can come in. When you're going to crop an image extremely and crop the environment out of an image, or if you're going to shoot with a very shallow depth of field or with a telephoto or portrait lens, you have to pay extra attention to why the image is important. Why is it interesting to look at? When you yeah, take away details and information, 
we're left with less. So you really, you have your execution has to be great and you have to really be pointed in what the goal of the image is. When you shoot something wider, when you shoot an environmental shot, you're helped out by so many elements that make it ultimately interesting. Because again, we're going to, we might look at an image. If I take an image of a street corner in Times Square, I can look at that image 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down, and it's only going to get better because it's going to be aged and it's going to have so much to look at. And every time you look at it, you'll find a new little detail that tells something about when it was taken. When I look at this image 100 years from now, I have nothing. If your pictures aren't uh, good enough, you're not close enough, well, that's one way of looking at it. But oftentimes, I will do an initial crop, and then I'll come back to the image months or even years later and realize that, you know, I cropped it in too tight. I, there's some interesting stuff that I took out that actually makes the image better. And look, this is a work in progress always. And even your earlier images might be um, improved by kind of taking and revisiting them with your new, more sophisticated eyes. If you're submitting stuff, don't be shy to include more because we're going to crop them. You know, uh, we're, we're not shy. We haven't done all that much cropping in this particular show, but when we see sort of a wide shot, we'll definitely try and maximize it and crop it and give you our two cents as to kind of how it's, it's going to, going to work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so so both these images are are tight and they're again kind of the worker bee images on their own. They're not necessarily going to change the world. And partially because again, you can't really see her expression, you can't really see the context of the image. And same too with the sewer grade image, you can't really see what's going on. But you know, you you kind of I think you it's best to kind of leave it a little loose and, and let us uh, do the uh, the cropping for you or give you our two cents with it. Um, I guess we've come to the end of the show. I just wanted to thank uh, Lucy, where all my images are safely stored. And I say safely because they're backed up. It doesn't matter what you're using. You just have to have them <laughs> backed up to to make that uh, make that a thing. And uh, I'll just also mention, I've got a couple of workshops coming up in uh, in New York. And one of them is... The Columbus Day Parade Workshop, where I've kind of negotiated special access. You know, Derek, you can't shoot a parade in New York City unless you've got a press pass. But this is one parade in the workshop that uh, we do have accreditation. So oh, I've been shooting awesome. it for like eight or nine years now. And uh, like so many of the things that I do, you know, I'm, I have all these images. I want to do something with them at some yeah. point. Maybe I'll do a little book or maybe I'll do this. Uh, we have to get them out of our Lacy hard drives yes. into places where people can see them because otherwise, you know, they're probably going to go away. The legacy of your work, you know, print a book, make some prints um, because, uh, you know, the, the screen, your website, you know, it's kind of fleeting. And what happens with an actual printed image? And I don't know if you had a chance, you know, I'd build, there were various booths and you saw some beautiful images. I'm always reminded when you see a beautiful print, you know, it, it, it's, it's more powerful than, than, you know, seeing the image on the screen. Definitely. I'm going to throw an unofficial, I'm not paid by them, but uh, we are friendly, but then we do have them on the program, uh, Loop Digital, a lab, and okay. they are Hanamula certified. Yeah. I, I prefer Hanamula paper. Again, this is an unpaid personal endorsement yeah. this is this is not bnh endorsing but uh check out you know build a relationship with a lab i did my own printing for years and i recently got rid of my printer because i don't print enough to justify cleaning it if you don't use it you have to maintain it and uh, it is an expensive proposition but i do want to want to throw out there steve you made a great point and it made me think of something especially since it's 9 11 we, we've become, especially in the social media age, so accustomed to, we know the big names, right? We know the Jay Maisels. We, we know the Joe Myrowitz. We know all these names and we think of, you know, only sometimes we think of that great images only came from the photographers whose names are everyday names. It takes an event like 9-11 every year. I'm sure everybody sees a new image that moves them. And it's by someone they've never heard of. It's by someone who just has a love for capturing images, by someone who has a great eye. 
someone who had a great vantage point, someone who felt the power and had the tool in hand to take an image to remember that moment. And that's the beauty of showing our images. Like you said, get them off of the, the hard drives. They are, you know, they exist to be seen. They can inspire others. How many people see something and it's like, wow, oh, I wish I had images of that. Your favorite store closes. I learned this over the, the pandemic when so many places that I loved and had given my business to over the years closed down and then I didn't have a chance to go and take one final image. And I was like, wait, I took it for granted. I was there all the time, never took a picture of it. Now I wish I had that memory of it. Take images. And even if you don't use them, I mean, we take the images so that we have them, so that we remember the moments. But get out there, print them, even if it's just for you. I print all the time. I print four by sixes just to have a record. I print books for myself. Um, not everything has to be sold. Not everything has to be put out into the world as art for others to see or to, to enjoy. Just do it because you love it. And I think, you know, if you're not doing anything with it, of course, everybody, everybody's different. Not everybody wants to put their, their stuff out there, but it's so much more powerful. If you've never printed your work, take five images you love. Even if, even if you, you can't afford to have them printed by a professional lab, just get them printed to hold that in your hand and have something tangible. It's going to resonate much more poignantly with you. You're going to look at those images in a different way. So I'll get off yeah. my soapbox now. <laughs> and I'll just quickly add, because just having just come from two days of reviewing at Build, I saw a lot of iPad stuff, but there were a lot of photographers that brought actual prints. And sometimes it was just laser prints, but even the laser prints were, they, they were very effective because, you know, the, the quality is such that, you know, the paper may be thin, but you can see all the images. And it was a lot easier to kind of look at the actual prints and it was a more powerful presentation, generally speaking, when they had prints. It was obviously a little more curated where they took the time to actually make those prints. And, and I think even that attention to detail in terms of actually choosing and printing um, is going to mean that what you submit, uh, you know, is going to be a little bit of a stronger take. And yeah, inspire yourself, you know, put, get a ledge in your living room and replace it, you know, once a month with 10 new laser prints of images that you made just to keep you inspired and and have the confidence to share and that's why we really appreciate you guys putting your images here we're honest you know we're, we're just saying you know what it is uh, we, we don't mention the photographer's name so unfortunately maybe you don't get the credit but it's really just about educating ourselves and and pushing ourselves to to move forward and get better because there are no limits to what we can do wonderful wonderful well I'll close it by saying, don't just print your images and put them out there to be seen, back them up, as Steve has said. So that's my reminder to thank Lacy for sponsoring this series, which is going to continue throughout October. And if Steve thinks it's going to end there, he's sorely mistaken because we love having <laughs> him back and you guys love it as well. So we're going to keep the critiques going, I believe next week, Steve, are we, are we back next week? I think so. I haven't even looked at the, the calendar. No, I know. No. I'm like, I'm just one day at a time. One I, foot right. I'm like, I, I got billed out of the way. And now I'm like, where, where do we go from here? Well, exactly. we do have them up on the website, but again, we're, we are going to have Steve at least for the time being through October. So get those images submitted, submitted, please pay attention to uh, the resolution on your images, the higher resolution image we have, the better your image is going to look and that wears better on the critique. So huge thank you to everybody who submitted Lacy for hosting. And of course the passionate photographer, Steve Simon for joining us once again. We will see you guys next time on another edition of the Passionate Photographer Critiques. Everybody have a wonderful day.